Me. Attorneys, they are gearing up for jury selection now, and we want to know how the process will unfold because the jury pool here is, well, uh, unusually large. It is very unusually large. This is a courthouse that, in a situation like this, they would normally have about 125 to 155 people to choose from. And now we're looking at a thousand people, 600 of whom are going to be at the courthouse today. 400 and wait in case they can't get the 12 jurors and the four alternates. Now, if we break down the math here, about one out of every five people, 85 people in this county has been called for jury selection. So it's going to be a very difficult process to find someone who doesn't know the family, whether it's the McMichaels, whether it's the Arberries, or whether it's a relative thereof, or just doesn't know anything about the case. So this this is expected to take about two to possibly three weeks in terms of jury selection. It's going to be a three-pronged approach here in terms of not just one person asking another person, you know, the information about their questionnaire. There are going to be three points within the courthouse where people will be questioned about this three-page questionnaire that they got to see if they can come up with 12 impartial jurors. Sharon, not an easy task. Yeah, it's not, Candace. Um, normally, with so much media attention, uh, defense attorneys, they ask to change the venue, right? Uh, move the trial somewhere else. But they did not do that this time. What could that mean? What are they telegraphing, if anything? You know, this is very important because, as you said, normally it is the case of something with this type of international media attention. Defense attorneys want to move to another venue. Here, I think this is really a sign that these defense attorneys think that they have allies within the community, that they might as well go ahead and stay here because they can find people who will support the McMichaels, people who will support William Bodie Bryan in this process. So it's a very <clears throat> interesting idea to think that they would not want to move because in speaking to many people um, in the media, they have said they are 100 percent sure that they can find those 12 people who will agree with them. So, Sharon, this is one that I think that it, while a lot of people have a lot of faith and while we've seen changes over the years, it is very concerning to many that defense attorneys are very comfortable to stay right here and pick people that they think that they will, can befriend and become allies within this jury. So not a good sign for the prosecution, but we will see, Sharon, how this turns out. Uh, the question of race, it's sure to come up um, during jury selection to begin with. And doesn't it have to? We, we know from reports, um, police on the stand um, during the preliminary process here saying what Ahmaud Arbery's final words, the final words that he heard, the N-word, Candace. So will that come up as part of the trial? You know, it will come up as part of the jury, of the voir dire, right, the jury selection. In terms of the trial, you know, we think back to the Chauvin trial, race wasn't an issue when we thought that it might be somewhere in there planted because we did hear about it so much during jury selection. But when it comes to this particular trial, you know, we're, we're really not just sure, we're not sure because of the evidence that the judge has and has not decided on in terms of race. For example, some of the information that that you mentioned in terms of maybe the text messages and the last information that was that was said um, by by the father and son team, um, we don't know whether or not that's going to make it in. I would suspect that race definitely would play a part in this because this is something that is a little bit different than the Chauvin trial because there's so much digital information, um, information in terms of them, you know, being on the phone uh, in, in jail, talking to people that will probably come into play. And unlike the Chauvin trial, I think that we will hear about race. And as Lee Merritt has said, we'll learn about what this particular county thinks about race, uh, what they thought about it a couple of years ago, and what they think about it now, just in terms of the culture, the people, and how they look at people who might cross the tracks and enter into another neighborhood who don't look like them. Let's talk about evidence then, if we can, for a moment, Candace. Um, will attorneys on both sides um, be presenting uh, to make their case? What evidence will they have? Well, you know, the evidence, I want to start with the defense, because, again, they feel very strongly, and it's interesting to think about what they're going to say. The defense is going to say, listen, a reasonable person with all of the evidence and information that they got beforehand, meaning these three men, would have done the same thing, and that this ultimately was a case that ended up in self-defense. So they're going to use the reasonable person standard, because they said that they had received 
uh, several pieces of information that somebody like Ahmad Arbery looked like um, somebody who had been there before on four occasions, so that they were just continuing to look for the guy that happened to be in the, you know, in the vicinity before, and they were carrying out what they could do by law. We know now that that law doesn't exist anymore in terms of these types of citizens' arrests. In terms of the the prosecution, they're really going to be looking at a situation here as to, well, why was this man even a threat? And why did you even have to use that amount of force if you were stopping someone just because you thought he might have, you know, stolen a couple of thousand dollars of piping, which was obvious that he did not have on his person because he was running freely and, and without anything that you could see. You can't carry that on your person, and that was evident to them. So, so it's going to be, you know, that juxtaposition that is really going to be some of the narrative that we hear about. And I think that, as you said, when we talk about race, that's going to be a big deal, too. Why were they using the N-word? Um, why were, uh, you know, why were so many people moved off the case because there was um, so much, um, because there yeah. was so much uh, wrongdoings by the part of the police in this situation and the DA? Yeah, this is a throwback. Uh, Jim Crow, alive and well. Um, we'll see what happens. A lot of people watching, a lot of people haunted uh, by yes. the case, by that footage that we can never unsee. Candace, thank you. We'll check back in with you next hour. Appreciate it. Stay with us here at BNC. We'll have extensive coverage of the Ahmad Arbery murder trial. We'll bring you the latest on air and online at bnc.tv.